Hereby, I open this academic ceremony in which Joana da Silva will defend the academic thesis Macroarena 199b and the hypertrophic heart, a journey across species. May I invite you to present a summary of your study and the conclusions of your thesis. Thank you, Prorector. Dear Prorector, dear members of the Corona, dear friends, family, and colleagues, today I'm going to guide you through my PhD project entitled MicroRNA 199B in the Hypertrophic Heart. And starting with some facts about cardiovascular diseases, did you know that they caused approximately one death every 1.5 seconds in 2021? This means that while we are here, on the past 10 seconds, approximately six people have died worldwide of cardiovascular diseases. But this is actually not something new, because this has been the leading cause of death worldwide for more than 40 years now. And why is that? Is it because research is not working hard enough to try to solve the problem, despite the socioeconomical burden that it represents to society? Are we not working hard enough? Well, numbers say that research in cardiovascular area has increased in the past few years. So people are really trying to solve the problem. But among the cardiovascular diseases, there are a lot of them. And some are harder to try to solve than others. And the more you understand about the disease, the more you will be able to, to solve it. So I've been focusing on a specific cardiovascular disease, which is cardiac hypertrophy. And this looks like a very hard name, but I can try to explain what it means. So your heart, it has to pump blood from it throughout your whole body. And usually it does so by pumping it from the ve left ventricle through this valve called the, the aortic valve. And usually in normal conditions, it, has, it, uh, it looks like this. So this is what the opening should look like. However, due to genetic factors or even lifestyle, lifestyle factors, your valve can become diseased. So the opening closes a bit and then your heart still needs to try to pump the blood outside of the heart through such a smaller opening. And as you can imagine, and if you can compare it to a pipe, if you have a pipe with a regular opening, the flow is quite nice. But then if you close the opening of this pipe, then the flow is lower. And then inside the pipe, the pressure is higher. And this is what, happen this is, what is happening on your left ventricle. It has to you have an, an increased pressure and increased force to pump the blood outside. So then it starts to grow to compensate for this stress. And in the beginning, it is impressive that it can maintain function. But with time, this is the first step to become sicker and sicker because as it grows, then it becomes dysfunctional. So we have been trying to focus on why the research is not really going forward in terms of clinical trials and in terms of coming up with new solutions. And we believe there is a gap. So if you go from preclinical research, in which you try to find um, new solutions in animal models, like mice and pigs, then you go to clinical trials if they work, and you try to test this in humans, and then if they work, you go to clinical practice. However, although every year there are a lot of new findings in mouse and in pig that look promising to try to solve cardiac disease, it looks like only some reach the clinical trials and only approximately 8% of the selected drug candidates will pass the clinical phases and reach the market, which means that only two out of 25 will make it to hospitals and patients. So there is a gap that we have to solve. We have to try to create new models, maybe try to improve the research from the beginning in a way that we are more confident that when we go through the phase of research, we are more confident that our results will be translatable. So what makes a good model for your research to be performed on? So you have mouse, you have pigs on the preclinical phase, but if you are trying to study cardiovascular disease, it's important that the cardiovascular disease of your model resembles the human one. So cardiovascular system should be similar, and in this case, a pig's heart is much, much more similar to the human one than a mouse one. So maybe a pig would be a better model. 
However, if you are studying a disease that is more prevalent in adults and in aging adults and aging population, then it's better for the pig to be an adult because the same way as a kid's system does not really resemble an adult one, then an adult pig should be used to study an adult disease as well. But if you are focusing on an animal that is healthy, you cannot conclude anything about how it becomes sick. So then you have to make it sick yourself. You have to induce the disease on it, so then you can study how it starts and how it progresses, and maybe you can even try to cure it. So how did we try to establish the disease in adult pigs? So we, had, we used adult mini pigs, and then in the beginning there was a normal heart. And the, the valve, it's quite difficult to handle by itself. So we tried to close the opening a bit above the valve, already in the aortic artery. And then we put a zip tie around it and we start tightening. But we tightened using also pressure catheters or pressure sensors inside the heart. So we tried to understand what was the pressure inside the heart as the band was being tightened. And then we only stop tightening the band when the pressure inside the heart of the pig would resemble the same as a patient having very severe um, cardiac hypertrophy. So then we could be more or less confident that the pig would kind of develop the same degree of disease as an, a patient. So we could be more, more confident that we could study how the disease progresses also in humans. So our results were that on this time of banding, so for uh, around eight weeks, the heart grew, so it became hypertrophic, as we saw that it has to do so to compensate for the stress. And along with the heart size, we also saw an increase in heart dysfunction. So the heart became less able to pump blood function on an efficient way. So the heart was also impaired. So then we have a sick pig. And why do we want to have a sick pig? Is it because we want to cure pigs? Well, it's more because we want to try to explore what is happening on a pig and then trying to extrapolate the results, try to understand how the disease is starting, how it is progressing, how, it, how we can treat it, and then extrapolate these results to human. But so far, the medicines that have been currently reaching clinical trials, they have shown very disappointing results because they are just trying to alleviate the symptoms instead of treating the root causes and the intrinsic mechanisms causing the disease. So then we focused on the inside, so on the intrinsic mechanisms. And if you zoom in into your heart, you will see that your heart muscles is composed by cells. And then in each cell, you have one or more nuclei. And then in this nuclei, you will find your genetic code, so DNA and RNA. And you can think of your coding part, so there is a, a part that codes for something that only your heart can read. So you can think of it as a cipher, for instance. There is a code, and your heart has to decipher what it means. So in your daily life, all your functions, all your physiology depends on how your body reads these ciphers. However, there's also a non-coding part so they don't code for anything, but they are there to influence how the message comes through your body. So how the message passes from your genetic code to the response that your body will, will get. And these are the microRNAs. So they don't code per se, but they influence a lot how your gen gen genes are sending a message. So still on the cipher metaphor, you can see that if everything is fine, you still, will, you still will have microRNAs playing around, but on a regular level, and everything should be fine. However, if there is a specific microRNA or some specific microRNAs that are overexpressed, so their relative abundance is quite high, then it, you can become sick because there is an imbalance on what it was supposed to be. And then we call it the dangerous mirrors because they have a detrimental role on your health, and this evil interference is already associated with several diseases, including dementia, cancer, and also heart diseases. So we decided to focus on their influence on our specific disease, which is cardiac hypertrophy. And so if you look at a normal heart, you see there are some levels of microRNAs. But on a sick heart, an hypertrophic heart, there is a specific microRNA that it's super increased. And because he is the villain of this whole story, we will call it Voldemir. 
And this Voldemir is super increased during disease, so we wanted to try to understand what happens if we try to lower the, its levels, try to restore the balance inside the nucleus, and how this would translate to a better uh, response. So then, we used a neutralizer. This neutralizer, its goal was to kind of inhibit the Voldemir, so when administered to the heart, it should go there, clean a bit the abundance, and then your heart restores the levels, it becomes a bit less sick, so a bit healthier, because it doesn't have so much interference of this Voldemir. And we have already tested this neutralizer before in mice. So it looked like in mice, if we have diseased mice suffering from cardiac hypertrophy, and they also have increased expression of the Voldemir, after giving them the neutralizer, it looks like the mice become much better. So their cardiac function improves, the mice become healthier, so it's a very nice therapeutic approach. But would this work also in our models, in pigs? That's what we wanted to know. So in my project, I decided to then apply this treatment to the model that I developed with adult mini pigs. So we randomly assigned them to receive either the neutralizer or saline, and then we subjected them to aortic banding to make them sick. And what we saw is that over time, the untreated pigs decreased their pumping efficiency. So their heart became worse, and they were not able to pump the blood as efficiently as before. On the other side, the pigs who received the neutralizer, their pumping efficiency quite of remained stable. So it looks like the neutralizer protect the pumping efficiency of the heart. Also in terms of heart size, that's how we measure the hypertrophy, we, we realized that the untreated pigs show a great increase in terms of heart size, while the pigs that received the neutralizer kind of maintain more or less the same size of the heart, so we didn't grow that, that much. So it also looks like the neutralizer prote protected from the abnormal growth of the heart. So it looks like we kind of made the pigs better, and this could be also a very appealing approach to use on the clinics. So as conclusions, we have de developed a new model of aortic banding in adult mini pigs. It resembles a clinical scenario of cardiac hypertrophy because we saw that while establishing the model, we saw that the pigs would develop the same pressure as the patients on a severe condition. So you are more or less sure that the pigs would resemble your clinical scenario. And then you can use it as a platform, not only to study the disease, so to study how the disease starts, how it progresses, but also you can use it to test new treatments. And then if you have new findings coming from research, you can try to use this model that mostly resembles the patient's situation and try to see if they work. Then we also suggest a treatment with a specific neutralizer to block the, the Voldemir. And this neutralizer seems to improve cardiac condition both in mice and in pigs. Um, and we, we think that this could be a promising strategy to use in the clinics. Of course, we would still need more evidence to confirm this, but it's nice to have at least a promising strategy that works on such a reliable model and relevant model to test new therapeutic approaches. So with this, I would like to conclude my presentation, and I will give the word back to the program. Thank you very much for your clear presentation. So the opposition will be opened by the chair of the assessment committee, Professor Leon Schurgers, professor of biochemistry of vascular calcification, University of Maastricht. Thank you, uh, Mr. Prorector, the candidate. Congratulations with your impressive work. I enjoyed reading your thesis very much. As a vascular biologist, I always learn a lot uh, reading about uh, heart disease. And we were also discussing uh, before the beautiful cover of your thesis, and we wondered whether or not you knitted this yourself. I lay esteemed opponent. Thank you for your kind words, but I didn't. Uh, it was a friend of mine who designed <laughs> it. <laughs> very beautiful. Um, and it's very impressive because you started in just when the COVID hit uh, the globe, mm -hmm. and you finished your work in three years. So 
congratulations to this beautiful work and in these congratulations also I want to uh, uh, bring them to your uh, supervisory team. Now, being a vascular biologist, I have to start at the beginning reading about the heart. So I started at the introduction. And in the introduction, you had this, this, this sentence which, which hit me a little bit because I was puzzled. You wrote, cardiovascular diseases are the leading cause of death worldwide, which can be fairly explained by the lack of effective therapeutic and diagnostic solutions. So is the lack of therapeutics the cause of cardiovascular disease? Because I thought cardiovascular disease are more let's say, um, being the, uh, the, 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 the consequence of Western-style diet and sitting the whole day. Can you explain that to me, what you mean with this sentence? Yes, highly esteemed opponent again, thank you. Uh, so I believe the lack of treatment options are mostly due to the lack of comprehension still about the disease. So of course there are a lot of factors that influence how the disease develops. So your lifestyle, genetic factors, all of this will have an influence, but I think you still need to understand how the disease starts and progresses in order to develop precision targets and try to target them more efficiently. So I don't think that the Western diet style is just the cause of the, of the disease. I, th I think there are many causes, but I think the more you try to explore all the factors in, involved, so you try maybe once you put a factor on and turn off the others and try to run, run it one by one, then you try to understand what is the influence of the several factors that can target. And then, of course, as you increase the understanding of the disease, then you can develop better approaches. Yeah, so, so then the therapeutic approaches would be So more you believe effective. more in uh, therapeutics than in prevention? I, yeah, I think prevention, but also because I know that during cardiovascular diseases, there are a lot of patients that don't have an option to be treated. So they kind of fall on the exclusion criteria. So even if they do not allow them to prevent the disease, but at least for them to have an option instead of just waiting for them to die. Yeah. So continuing, you know, reading your title, I really was uh, impressed, a journey across species. And then reading it then, um, I like this challenging title. So in chapter two and four, you use this large animal model, the mm -hmm. Vietnamese mini pigs, which you base on the previous work of, of, uh, of your supervisory team in mice. And you use this pig model because you argue that mice are not the right model to study human disease. And to my surprise, at chapter five, you went to mice again. So if you have this journey across species, why going back to a species that you don't believe in? Yeah, so the mice, of course, it's not the right model to, to study cardiovascular disease for sure. But I think in terms of financial issues and also ethics, you first need to start with a small animal model before you start performing your research on a larger one. And also for pigs, we went there after we went with the mice. So only when we confirmed our hypothesis, we were able to scale up to a large animal model. And for this pap disease, we still don't know a lot. So it's still uh, in its infancy, I can say. So then we have to start from the beginning yeah. and try to explore it there. Of course, ideally, a larger animal model would be more reliable, but then we have to start somewhere. I agree first. with you. Larger animal model is, is way better. But then you have to induce the disease because yeah. a normal pig will not develop hyper so you use aortic banding, mm -hmm. and this is, let's say, um, uh, mimicking aortic valve calcification stenosis. Yes. Now what you do is with the banding is a kind of acute disease induction, whereas aortic valve disease develops over lifetime. So do you think that the lack of the aging component in your study could also um, 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 skew a little bit the results that you get from this artificial animal model? Yes, indeed, of course. I think it can play a, a crucial role, the fact that during lifetime in, in humans, it progresses throughout age, but we were also trying to establish a model in which the pigs are already starting with a pressure inside that are already resembles a severe um, phenotype. So although they, they are forced to be already on a severe state so it's not really progressive, then we wanted to see if we bended them for a longer time, if they would become worse and worse. And then if you can, of course for my study, I didn't have a lot of time to, to, to perform the studies, but maybe if you give them more time and instead of waiting nine weeks, you, can, you give them like 20 or one year and try to assess how the disease progresses, maybe you'll be more sure. But then at the same time, 
yeah, of course there is a huge component, but I think our model is a bit beneficial compared to the other pigs that they kind of let them grow, because in terms of letting them grow, they want the band to grow with them. So the banding um, grows with them. And this leads to quite reduced reproducibility, so your groups are not very comparable, and at the same time you are not really sure that you have the pressure inside the, the left ventricle that it leads to the disease. Yeah. So, so we always work with minimalistic models uh, to, yeah. to try to mimic human disease. So could you speculate with me, because you only describe two species mm -hmm. in, your, in your thesis, mice and pigs, whether or not you can come up with an animal model which develops hypertrophy naturally? Uh, I also studied EHTs, so this was the more humanized model that we, we could use also. And this would allow me to, to try to study the disease. And unfortunately, we could not really establish a phenotype of disease. But for us, we would like to also use the technique from Professor Inish uh, with the myocardial slices. Yeah. So if we could have slices that already are from hypertrophic hearts, then it would be amazing to yeah. check if, whether but it would work. I think the EHDs are a really great model, but I meant more, let's say, look at the animal kingdom. Mm. Are there animals with hypertrophy? And think of the giraffe. The giraffe has hypertension. It has a blood pressure of 220 over 180. It has a hypertrophic heart. No fibrosis. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I guess also this, the cardiovascular system of a giraffe does not really compare to the human one, so this would be a factor that we had to consider, right? Yes, of course. <laughs> it is a natural model. <laughs> okay, maybe something to consider. I'm happy with all your answers and give the word back to the thank co-writer. You. So thank you very much. So the opposition will now be continued by Professor Thomas Eschenhager. He's Professor of Experimental Pharmacology and Toxicology at the University Medical Center, Hamburg, Eppendorf, Germany. Thank you very, very much, Mr. Prorector. Um, dear candidate, first of all, congratulations to your work. I, as my colleague, really liked, uh, enjoyed reading it. I think you, it's a lot of work you did. It's a important work because this question we were just discussing about the model is really central to our entire field. So I think you were tackling a really critical uh, question and came up with interesting and important answers. And I also would like to congratulate you for your very nice language style. So it was really nice to read you. And, and actually in your talk, you demonstrated that you are able to translate your uh, work to a public language, which I think is very good. So, to come back, to come to a more specific uh, question, um, as a pharmacologist, everything is a question of dose. And I noted that uh, the doses you used were pretty different from doses used before. And I was wondering what was the reasoning behind it and how did you come to this dosing? Highly esteemed opponent, thank you very much for your words and for your question. Yes, indeed, it took us some time to optimize the dosage to use because before we came from mice and we even performed uh, optimization of our antagomir where we used different dosages from, I don't know, five until 260. And we realized that we could inhibit the microRNA even with a small dose of five milligram per kilogram per day. However, if you think of the via of administration, because in mice we were doing it interperitoneally and for three consecutive days. When you try to translate it for a pig, where you will administer intracoronarily, so it will be much more localized, it will be already in the heart, and you will not administer it for three consecutive days, but only one dose, then you have to try to calculate what to do. So then, according to our estimations, we, we took into consideration the, the heart of the pig, and we assessed like more or less what would be its weight. And then we tried to come up with a solution and then it led us to try first uh, around five milligrams. But then with the five milligrams, we only saw about 70% of inhibition. So then we decided to go with a three times higher dose mm -hmm. with 15. So then we got best results with the 15 doses and then we stick to it. Okay. So yeah. that explains the difference of the translation from mice to human. That's but right. again, for, for the pharmacokinetics, we had to, again, convert the doses for mice again. Yeah. Thank you. Um, 
A second aspect is um, you use, as everybody or many people in the field, you use molecular markers of hypertrophy, not only the size of the heart, but mm -hmm. also some molecular markers. And you use, for example, myosin heavy chain 7. Yes. And this paradigm has been, as you know, uh, developed in rodents. And I would like to know uh, how you translate this aspect to your model, the pig, which is actually quite different. And I was specifically then wondering how, do, how can you see this large increase. I was wondering about, I, I was surprised to see that. Yes, so um, the myosin heavy chain marker, it's both true that it increases during hypertrophy, both in mice and in, in pig and in large animal models, but in large animal models, it is the main isoform. So the huge increase that we saw in terms of fold change, it's quite unexpected indeed. Mm -hmm. So we believe that this is mostly due to the relative quantification method that we used and to the very poor, uh, the group that we have for, for standards, so our controls, they were very d d dispersed, so they do not really, they had a lot of batch effects, so they all, they were all over the place. So then it was very difficult for me to try to have a very coherent group to compare with. So very small differences in the relative method quantification then will be super amplified uh, by this deficient sham group, I would say. So I think there is an increase and it's positive, so it would corroborate our mm. findings that there is hypertrophy, but I wouldn't trust that much the full change because I think it is amplified by the, the, the method of quantification for sure. That gives me a, a good reason to ask the third question, namely quantification of Western blots is an issue, not only with you, but everywhere. And I was wondering, what do you know about the challenges and how did you deal with the challenges of doing the quantification with Western blotting? Yes, yeah, so especially for pigs, there are <laughs> very poorly <laughs> described antibodies, so I had to try to test a lot of them. Uh, I managed to find some uh, antibodies that really resulted, but what I faced was some difficulties in trying to measure the levels of protein of their quinine uh, in healthy models, so the sham pigs. Uh, we could always measure them on the pigs where it was overexpressed, so on the treated pigs. So then I guess there is a threshold and uh, below that you cannot really measure them. Uh, but yeah, indeed we faced a lot of, of uh, troubles with the optimization. But of course, sometimes there is a difference between the mRNA levels and the protein levels and it is quite described that sometimes, although the, the one changes, the other does not do it at the same time or it doesn't do it like comparably? That would be my first, fourth question. But uh, I still want to, to dwell a bit on the Western blood issue. I would like to talk, uh, you to talk of linearity. Mm -hmm. You said it's difficult if, if the background is low and that's actually true, but I mean, you can do a lot with the Western bloods. You can expose short, you can expose long, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. So how did you do that to deal with this question of yeah, linearity? For, uh, for Dirk 1A, I had quite trouble also to optimize the time of exposure of the membrane. So I started first with 45 minutes, then I increased oh. to, yeah, then I increased, <laughs> <laughs> I increased the exposure to one hour. And then I think after I one hour and a half, I think it was pointless. So then I gave up. But then it was just like, since we got really nice pens for the ones that were treated, mm -hmm. we were just like trying to work with what we had because the antibody was working for the ones where the levels were above the threshold. It's just like the ones where it was below the threshold, we couldn't really detect yeah. it. My last question. You showed this nice um, code and decipher, deciphering, uh, and everybody thinks, and that's also what, what it's in the textbooks. You have the DNA, you have the RNA, it's translated into protein, and that's doing the function. And you said already uh, that often that doesn't really fit. Yeah. So you have a change in the protein without having a change in mRNA, and even the other way around sometimes. And I would like to, you to, to explain this a little bit. Why is it, what happens on this, on this transcription translation between the DNA and the function? Yeah, so basically this? when we use a, mi a microRNA, he will try to influence the expression of a protein. It can Usually it inhibits it. It can either send it to degradation or just block it for a bit. So then it can either silence it or 
just decrease its levels. But then, of course, in terms of function, sometimes you think that a specific mechanism is associated with a specific protein, but it's just a set of different proteins that are playing a role. So then sometimes, although you see that there is an increase or a decrease on your protein of interest, and it doesn't really match with your microRNA, it can be that because it is regulating it post-transcriptionally, then it can mean that your final result, it's not really causing the problem per se, so there is, there is something else happening in the meantime that is leading to a, a gap between what is happening on the protein level and on the mRNA levels. And also in terms of time of effect, there is a delay between the time in which you regulate it on the mRNA levels and, on the and when you see the result on the protein, because they kind of have to compete for the agro proteins, and then this can require a lot mm -hmm. more time until you see an effect actually happening. So then can also explain the gap. Thank you very much. I'm very happy with your answers and give it back to the prorector. Thank you. So the opposition will be continued by <coughs> Professor Ines Falcao Pires, who is with us online. She's professor of cardiovascular physiology at the Faculty of Medicine, University of Porto in Portugal. Please. Good afternoon. First, I would like to greet all the jury members and the Prorector of University of Maastricht. It's a great pleasure to argue this thesis, even if online. Dear candidate, I consider yourself a, promise of research, a promising researcher, who I first met in the first train heart meeting, uh, a Marie Curie action, and I was immediately impressed by her determination and intelligence from the start. After the meeting, I sent a WhatsApp message to Paula da Costa Martins, saying, parabéns pela Joana, grande recrutamento, which means congratulations for hiring Joana, great team acquisition. And this sounds better in Portuguese, in Portuguese, by the way. Almost four years later, I must say Joana did not let me down at any time. I believe our great achievements will extend beyond this thesis. And you know, you are within my top three favorite ESR uh, girls from the train heart. So regarding the presentation, it was very clear and well-structured. It, it reads re very well. And I have to congratulate on the fact that you present a large animal model of left ventricle hypertrophy, especially during times when there's a high pressure to reduce animal experimentation. And due to that, you cleverly presented alternatives such as human engineered heart tissues. So my first question goes to chapter two. I was, of course, impressed by the, the large animal model. I know how much work is behind it. And there have been studies that report in these bending models that the bending might be internalized by the aorta. It looks from figure one that this was the case. So I would like to ask you, would it be possible to remove the aortic constriction using this model in order to study reverse remodeling of the heart? Thank you very much for your kind words. You are also one of my favorites on the consortium, but don't tell anyone. And <laughs> answering your question, um, I believe so. So we didn't see internalization in our model. So we know that in pink pigs there was some internalization, but in our pigs when we opened them after the euthanasia, we didn't see internalization of the banding. So I think there is a difference between the normal pink pigs and the Vietnamese pigs that we used. And I think it would be possible to remove the constriction, but I think the um, the surgery complications would be hard to, to predict, I think. It is possible, of course, you can always remove the zip tie, but it's difficult to uh, predict how it would go. But it would definitely be something that we would like to test and see if we could then uh, study reverse remodeling for sure. Okay. Fibrosis is usually a big issue when you go for the second time to the thorax, so that, that should be the case. Regarding chapter four, how do you think uh, anti-MIR 199B exerts its antifibrotic effects? In terms of fibrosis, we had um, a bit of trouble in terms of inducing fibrosis in our models because both in pigs we saw something and uh, also in terms of, uh, of mice we saw something, but it should be a clear hallmark from the beginning, so we were expecting more than we saw. So um, it's difficult to conclude from that, but I think our, our microRNA is involved in calcineurin and fat pathway, and I think it is from that, and also influencing TGF-beta and other pathways, it could be 
one of the reasons why it is um, affecting this, these pathways. And we also try to sequence these models. So we compare the, the banded models with also uh, samples from aortic patients um, and performed RNA-seq. And we saw that there are a lot of pathways involved in especially inflammatory pro processes and, um, and others related to fibrosis that are, are being super act activated. So I, I think this microRNA could be playing a role not only in terms of NFAT, calcineurin and fat pathway, but also trying to uh, interfere with inflammatory and DGFP on, on fibrosis. Okay, because at eight weeks after PAP, it, it, it shows at least in, in histological pictures, it looks like it is having some antifibrotic effects. Um, regarding the engineer heart tissue, uh, figure five on page 100, I have some doubts there. Why the hypertrophic tissue does not show an increase of the hypertrophic markers, uh, like in figure five J to K. And how can you, can you tell me a little bit more how this afterload enhancement protocol is done in order to induce hypertrophy and for how long it stays and persists over time because I got the idea that it could be something that temporarily goes back to normal. Yeah, so this model basically you use these um, stiff braces that you put on both hands of the EHTs and then since they create resistance, they, they are stiff, they can, the EHTs cannot beat really properly so then it increases the afterload. But, and there is also a lot of different stiffnesses that you can use to try to increase the afterload or decrease it. And in the past, this strategy has worked pretty well also in rat cardiomyocytes, and it has been reported that it also works on, on human models. However, this was my first time doing it, and uh, we I had also to kind of get used to how, in, how to insert the, the braces in a way that it really reaches the, the, the end of the well, so then the EHT is really stuck and cannot beat properly anymore. So I think the establishment of the phenotype had a lot of practical issues that came from me, because I was not used to the, to the protocol and I never did it before, but I also think that previous findings have shown that Hypertrophic models are very difficult to establish on, on these humanized models, especially if you only have one cell type, because my model only had cardiomyocytes. So I believe if you can try to improve also the model in terms of getting multicellular types and also try to come up with strategies that mim mimic better not only the pharmacological but also the mechanical uh, afterload, maybe you can reach a better protocol, but unfortunately I wasn't able to see the same, but I think it's due to, to the braces that we use to increase the afterload. Okay, so regarding chapter 5, um, PAP was performed in, in mice older than 8 weeks old on both genders you mentioned on your methods. I was a little bit concerned with this issue because considering the sex differences in terms of size in the beginning, females are much lighter and smaller than males. Even in the end of the protocol, they do not reach the initial way of the males. So did you adapt the, the size of the needle when you were doing uh, pulmonary artery bending? Because this can be an issue as the constriction might not be strong enough in females and it will increase you the variability of your results and you have a certain degree of variability that might be um, precluding the results that you have or unless they are well distributed males and females by each one of the PEP groups so I would like you to tell me a little bit more about that I would also like to see it differentially represented in figure one when you show the gradients the the PAP gradients and also on the Fulton index, how females and males are distributed on those graphs. So I didn't understand the last part of your question. Sorry about the graphs. Uh, if they if they had a representation of males and females, we could see that there were differences in terms of the stenosis and the, the bending in females versus males. 
Yeah, so this part of the study, the, um, the first part of the study was performed in collaboration with the University of Groningen and I was still not a PhD by then. So I didn't have any control in the study design. I joined a bit afterwards. So I believe I was told, I don't know if it's true or not, that they had a requirement for, um, for the, the study to include both genders, so both males and females. But... I believe they took into consideration the fact that females usually require a different needle and although they do not really they do not really told us what was the difference between genders and we don't know if there was in terms of phenotype uh, we believe that was taken into consideration to standardize the protocol from the beginning and then we tried to come up with a more homogeneous group from the start. Okay. That might be something for the reviewers. So this was my last question. Thank you so much, dear candidate. And I will give back the word to the prorector. Thank you very much, Professor Falcao. So the opposition will be continued by Professor Marie-José Gaumans, who is Professor of Molecular Cardiovascular Cell Biology at the Leiden University Medical Center. Thank you very much, uh, uh, prorector. Dear candidate, I must admit that uh, I already kind of wanted to ask you about how to make this beautiful heart, but now I have to talk to somebody else. But having said that, I want to congratulate you with this uh, beautiful manuscript with a lot of very elegantly uh, uh, designed experiments. And I think this clearly shows, together with your presentation, that you're on topic, which makes it a lot of fun to be able to discuss with you. Um, the first thing after your presentation, I kind of was waiting when you started with the Voldemir. Who, who is your Harry Potter in this story? <laughs> Highly esteemed opponent, thank you very much for your uh, nice words and for your uh, and for your question. Well, I guess our Harry Potter would be the neutralizer who will compete with the Voldemir to try to well, I abolish think, I, its I effect. I think you are the Harry Potter because the Voldemir. The, the, a new yeah. trial is the ones that you're going to use. Yeah, that's true. And I had to optimize it, so it all came from us. Absolutely. <laughs> so then I would like to ask one of your paronyms to read proposition number seven. Okay. What you do makes a difference, and you have to decide what kind of difference you want to make. Jane Goodall. I kind of... I wanted to ask one of the three below, but those are in Portuguese, so I thought I'd stick to the, the English one. But I've read this a couple of times, and I think there's a lot of truth in there. So I would like to ask you, what kind of difference did you decide that you made with your research and the wonderful thesis that you put here today? Yeah, so since I was a kid, I had to deal with hospitals a lot. So in my family, there was also some problems. So then I decided that one day I would like to try to contribute to a better cure. And also in terms of cardiovascular diseases in my family, it's been a constant. And even now I suffer myself from a genetic condition that will eventually affect my heart most likely. So then I believe that if I am here even for a short or a long time, I don't know, but I would like to contribute to, the, to a better comprehension of the disease. So maybe in the future, I don't know if maybe while I'm still alive, or, but in the future, the kids of my kids, maybe they will have a solution to treat problems that now we are not able to treat. So I guess that would be the difference that I would like to make to be able to treat people. That would be awesome. Well, that even makes you more the Harry Potter of your story, I think. <laughs> so now going back to uh, the science in your book. So I was really pleased with the, the use of a uh, pig model, because indeed, we, we start small, preferably by cells in a dish, making it from a 2D to a 3D, via zebrafish, mice, ending up in the human, but the pig is a good phase in between. And although it's very important that we, we kind of use the right model to answer the right questions, you know, really signaling we want to do in cells and not in pig hearts, I was intrigued by the fact that you use Vietnamese adult mini pigs. Because we know from animal studies, from mouse studies, that if we look at teacher beta signaling or inflammation and the response after myocardial infarction, it does really matter if I use a black six mouse over an FVB or 129. So using the Vietnamese adult mini pig, which is, I think, not the ones that's commonly used uh, in the studies, 
Do you think that you might encounter uh, problems with this different response in the background that might hamper or maybe influence the outcome that you have? And how would you study this? Yes, unfortunately, there are, there's also not a lot of papers already describing this model, so it's still a new model being reported, but it's, it's already showing some similarities with the cardiac system of humans that some other do not. Um, for instance, in terms of heart rate, in terms of dysfunction, in terms of parallelism with the vascular system, I think it resembles much more the human one than other pigs. And also the other pigs, sometimes they have the disadvantage of while growing, it's difficult to handle them and they can reach 200 kilos super fast so that it's it's very difficult also to use them to translate the results. But definitely I believe that in terms of genetic differences in terms of one and the other there are. And as I also mentioned in one of the chapters, these Vietnamese uh, pigs, these Vietnamese pigs, they are not really annotated, their genome. So then when we did the RNA sequencing, we had a lot of issues trying to find uh, breeds to then use on ensemble to then really find homology. So then this was really something that was an obstacle for us. So I think if I would have in limited time and money, I would start by <laughs> annotating the genome of the Vietnamese mini pigs and then maybe work from there. Yeah, I think I agree with you fully. So then, then if you want to use this porcine model, and there's of course a couple of diseases, heart diseases, that we really don't understand a lot about. So a lot of emphasis was on, on the, the heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, and of course the heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is a, is a different ball game. Um, do you think that uh, the, the pig is the way to go to get more insight in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction? So most of the models until, like, so far they mostly resemble the, the preserved ejection fraction uh, phenotype because they really don't develop a lot of systolic dysfunction. They mostly stay on some, sh some signs of diastolic dysfunction, but not in terms of systolic. So I think most of the described uh, models in pigs are of FPEF. But we were able to see FPEF in the beginning, so if we analyze the results after four weeks, it looks like we also don't see uh, systolic dysfunction, we only see diastolic. But as we progress and as we try to analyze it from a, a longer perspective, it looks like they start to, to develop it. So then it would be also a good model to understand how it progresses from concentric to eccentric and from FPEF to eventually FREF, if ever. Yeah. I, th I think we have to start investing in a lot of uh, uh, pig housing to do all this long-term experiment. <laughs> so um, if we may have another question. So I wanted to go to chapter five, where of course in the left side of the heart is interesting, but the right side of the heart is more fun <laughs> and even less uh, well understood, I think. Um, and there you went back, uh, as already mentioned, to the mouse. And I can understand that for the first set of experiments where you have a mouse with a genetic modification. Mm -hmm. But in the second half of the experiment, you use an antimer. And then you're not necessarily bound to a mouse. Um, I would rather go to a rat where you see better input, impact. So what was the decision to stay with the mouse, especially if you look at the, the pressures that you induce are not that high if you would consider it to be a right heart failure. Yeah, so this was actually the continuation of a previous protocol that we have started. And then the beginning we had just a pilot study in which we tested the antagomir and it looked like it worked. So we have been also trying to optimize this pulmonary artery bending for some time ago and it looked like this pressure would be enough to induce uh, more or less the pressure that we would need to eventually lead to the systolic dysfunction. But we know that rats are a much better model to study this and they develop hypertrophy on a more severe way for sure. Uh, but for us it was mostly because we were trying to optimize this protocol and we were, this was what we had available at the, at the time. But if we could, we would either try rats or even also mouse but with, I don't know, one Or pigs. Yeah, or pigs. Yeah. <laughs> with a CTEF model maybe. <laughs> Thank you very much for all your answers and I give the word back to the project. Thank you. So the opposition <clears throat> will be continued now by Dr. Ingrid Dijkraaf, Associate Professor in Biochemistry, University of Maastricht. Please. Thank you, Pro Rector. Dear candidate, first I would like to congr uh, congratulate you and 
your whole promotion team with uh, the, the completion of this thesis. Uh, you did a tremendous amount of work during uh, three years, only three years, so uh, my compliments for that. And it was really a pleasure to, to read your thesis, so uh, I, I really like to go through it. Um, I, I do have some questions about uh, the compound you used in, in, in mainly the, the animal studies. And um, because if I understand it correctly, uh, those are also uh, RNA-based compounds, this antagomere. And what I know from my studies is that uh, RNA molecules are very instable. Uh, if I was isolating RNA, um, you always have to be very careful, and that's why I chose organic chemistry, I think. Uh, so... Um, do you know anything about the stability uh, of your compound? Esteemed opponent, thank you very much for your kind words and for your questions. So before uh, my studies with the Santagomir, we performed an optimization study where we compared this chemistry with some others. So we tried locked, locked nucleic acids. We tried this same Antagomir, but with the cholesterol group on the three end inside, instead of the five end. We tried different ribose modifications, and we saw which one presented a better IC50, so we could use a lower dose to be... Uh, to reach uh, as the same level or more in terms of efficacy. So then this one, um, in terms of stability, was increased because we have the, the, the sulfide bonds in the, in the structure, so then already it increases its stability on circulation, so it increases its lifespan. And because it can reduce a bit the targeting the, the, the bending affinity for the target, then we combine with other modifications. So we also, on the, on the ribose, we try to, to use a 2 methyl group, and then this also is uh, described to, to increase the stability yeah. of the drug. And the cholesterol on the 5 end is also a bioconjugate uh, expected to improve the internalization and the uptake by cells of the antagomere. So there were some modifications that were possible to increase the half time of the antagomere on the body and yes. its pharmacokinetic properties. Uh, still, we saw that, at least in our study in mice, that after two weeks we already see um, a decay in terms of presence of the antagomere. So it looks like it's being cleared on the first two weeks. So I guess further improvements would maybe pass through like encapsulation with some more specific uh, nanocarriers yes, or microcarriers yes, yes, yeah. to increase yeah. it further. Yeah, yeah. Now, okay, now I, I understand because in chapter one you already described some modifications, but I didn't know which kind of modifications were in your antagomere uh, 199B. So uh, yeah, thanks for this uh, clarification. Um, an uh, important aspect is also the immun immunogenicity of, mm -hmm. of, of uh, RNA-based molecules. And uh, thanks to uh, the Nobel Prize winners, we know that you have to do some modifications there as well to make these less immunogenic. Do you have any uh, idea how immunogenic your compound is and how could you test this? Yeah, so in terms of uh, inflammatory response, we did a lot of testing in terms of histology mostly. So we tried to assess if there was infiltration of uh, inflammatory cells, not only on the heart, but also in lungs, liver, kidney. Especially because we saw that the antagomere is mostly uh, accum accumulating and inhibiting the microRNA on the lung and on the kidney and only then on the heart. So we were a bit afraid that this could lead to hepatotoxicity and some other adverse effects due to off-target um, to off target uh, accumulation. However, we didn't see any signs of toxicity, at least for the dosages we used. We know that for mice, when we did the, the study with a, um, a wider range of, of doses where we went above 80, then above 80 we saw some toxicity for the, for the mouse. So they started to show some discomfort, and when you reach 200, then they started dying in two, the two days. So as long as you keep the, the, the dose as we are keeping, we don't see any signs of immunogenicity, but also the, um, the modifications that this antagomere is having, they are also supposed to be more um, 
willing to kind of treat the immuno, the yeah, immune yeah. system to, to not be considered a, a foreign body and so Indeed. not yeah. be exocited. Okay, yeah, thank you. And uh, I have a look, yeah, I can ask one other question. Um, and that's about the route of administration, because you use different routes, you injected intracoronary, intraperitoneally. Um, what if you want to go with Antagomia 199B to the clinic? Mm -hmm. What would be the preferred route of administration? And um, yeah, how would you do this? Uh, do you need some other compounds to make it more stable or to get it uh, where it should be? Yeah, so first thing would be to optimize it so it doesn't last only maybe two weeks and it can last for longer. So after optimization, I would suggest uh, intravenous administration in patients because there is a very famous and interesting paper from Professor Thomas Tum in which he compares the, um, the efficacy of administering two consecutive injections intracoronarily and then instead of two intracoronarily injections they do one intracoronary and one IV and they don't see much difference. So it looks like an IV refill would be enough to keep the levels up so then it would be much easier to do it on the clinics instead of an intracoronary <laughs> injection. Yeah, yes, <laughs> yes, I fully agree, I fully agree. Okay, with this I give the word back to the productor. Thank you very much Dr. Dijkgraaf. And now the opposition will be continued and ended by Dr. Miranda Nabe, Assistant Professor of uh, Genetics and Cell Biology, University hey, of Massachusetts. Thank you. So, yeah, dear candidate, of course, I would like to congratulate you as well. And uh, you did a, a really great job here and also compliments to the supervising team. I have to admit, at first I was a bit worried because I received the thesis about a week ago, so I thought, oh, I have to read the whole thing, but actually it was so well written that was also acknowledged already. But yeah, so it, it was really a pleasure to read it. So compliments on that. Uh, but of course, I also have some questions for you. And um, one of them is, is a bit in relation to uh, the question of Professor well, Ines, or I'm not going to try to pronounce her last name. <laughs> but uh, that, that was with respect to the sex differences. And I think you, you briefly explained that you, the first study that was done in collaboration with Groningen and you did ha not have a choice to yeah. pick one of the sexes. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think at least what I based on, on what was in your thesis, I think you choose to go for male pigs uh, for the rest of your studies. And you also write that they were uncastrated males. Yes. So basically my first two questions were, are like, why did you pick males and why is it important that they are uncastrated? Esteemed opponent, thank you very much for your kind words and your question. Yes, that's a very good point. So we did some research and we found that estrogen and testosterone would have an impact on the level of hypertrophy that you would develop after banding. And it looked like the males and the uncastrated ones, because then the hormones would be more or less more controlled, I think. So then they would um, kind of develop a better and more predictable state of hypertrophy after aortic banding. So that was the the main rationale to use male uncastrated pigs and also adults, so older than one year old. And also on the on the mouse study on the last chapter, when we we designed the study for the antagomy treatment, so when we tried to compensate and for that we only used also only males. But I think since we also performed bioinformatic analysis on the first study in which the two genders were used, I think with the raw dot data, although we didn't do it for this study, we can also try to find some specific um, molecular signatures associated with one and the other if we want. So then that could also be useful to know further about these gender differences in mouse. Okay, I'm happy with that answer because that, I think in a response to the question of Professor Essenhagen, you said there were different needles needed for females. I thought if that's the only difference, then <laughs> I'm a bit worried, but luckily it's uh, more than that. Uh, but then still I have a question, because in the same, uh, well, in chapter four you, you used the male pigs, mm -hmm. but then you went to the engineered heart tissue, and that's derived from female yeah. donor. So can you comment on that? Like, yeah, we have been trying to test the, the antagomir first on these EHTs, and we received, and this is the line that they have been using. And so far, we only wanted to kind of have an idea if, our hypothesis would be translatable. So I think we didn't have a lot of choice there in terms of the gender of the donor. But I 
I think it could have an influence in terms of differences, uh, genetically intrinsic differences, but then we did the whole differentiation the same way, so it can be that by differentiating them, differentiating them ourselves, the, the, the genetic differences are not as pronounced as if they would grow on a male or a female, so maybe we would have more control on, over that. Okay. Thanks. And then I still had another question uh, with respect to chapter four, because um, I think in, what is it, F uh, on page 96, your figure three, I think that shows your uh, cardiac functional data. And my question would be, like, if I read the chapter, it seems like you're quite positive about your treatments in, of your sick pick, how you call it. My question is, if I look at these figures, and yeah, it seems like you already know what I'm going to ask, I'm not so convinced if there is a big, well, protective effect there. And especially if I look at the eight-week time point, how, what, what is your like conclusion in the end. Is it that beneficial or not? So I think it's promising, but we would like to repeat. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> we would have to repeat the studies, of course, with a larger and like sample size to have more uh, statistical significant conclusions to withdraw. But we also had a lot of technical issues because we were supposed to have groups of pigs, like of six pigs taken all after four weeks of banding and they were all only taken like some because we had a complication with our surgeon and some were taken after four, some were taken after nine, some were taken after eight and then we, have, we had to work from there. So then the, um, the statistical power is quite lower in terms of that. But I think still what we saw here, it's, it's promising. Although we don't have a lot of homogeneity in terms of group, which we would benefit from. Um, I think the moment we try to really design a study, avoid these patch effects and confounders, and maybe then uh, sequencing again the, the differences between one and the two, because already with some lower, like a, a really small amount of samples with RNA sequencing, we already see some similarities with the patients with aortic stenosis. So if we have such a small number of samples and still we see something, maybe if we go bigger, then maybe the differences are being even more spotable, so. Okay, could the timing also be, like, play a role if you would have waited a bit longer that you would have seen? Yes, definitely. So I think this is also one of the most, the main advantages of our model, because it looks like you can kind of uh, study the progression of the disease as you manipulate the time of bending. So you can really use the model to study earlier stages of the disease, but also how it progresses to a more severe state in the end. So then this versatility could also be very beneficial to study the disease further and to understand the comprehension of how it progresses. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I also had a, a bit more of a broader question because yeah, you focus your work on a lot of different models and then main focus is about the big models that you set up, which is really impressive that you set it up. My question would be like, it's still a big model. Why did you decide to focus on developing this big model rather than optimizing the engineered heart tissue, for example, the human models? Well, I guess it depends on the project, <laughs> but uh, yeah, my project was specifically about aortic stenosis and it was specifically about how to use this antagomir to treat and it's supposed to treat cardiac hypertrophy. So then I focused. Thank you. You can just finish your, uh, your answer. <laughs> Thank you. So since our group before found this new antagomir and this target specifically for cardiac hypertrophy, we wanted to continue our studies in terms of understanding how potential this new therapeutic uh, approach would be. So then that's why I focused on that. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So Joanna da Silva, so the time appointed for defending your thesis has passed. The degree committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and your defense. I request that you and your company await the results of our deliberations and our return in this room. The PhD defense has now ended. 
The degree committee will debate the candidate's performance behind closed doors. This process usually takes about 10 minutes. is tied long road i don't waste no time break rules because fate decides with the team and we chase the light i make a move fall down shake it off i hate to lose that branch break it off no room for negativity praise and love prepare for deep park because we're taking off Get the
So, Joanna da Silva, the degree committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis and your defense in view of the, its very positive verdict and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Professor Da Costa Martins is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom. I invite your supervisor to now take the floor and give the right. honors. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times? To be careful and honest, transparent, independent and responsible? Yes, I do. By the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present, I hereby confer upon you, Joana Alves de Silva, the degree of doctor and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. As evidence of this, I now present you with a degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary and the other members of the committee and affixed with the official seal of the university. Dr. Alves da Silva, dear Joana, Joana, wow. Congratulations on achieving this milestone, your PhD, becoming a doctor in philosophy, for the ones who don't know what it means. Of course, my congratulations also to your family, who I'm sure supported you all along the way, even if from a distance. Espero que sejam tão orgulhosos dela como eu estou, e orgulhosos em vocês próprios por tê-la educado e torná-la na pessoa que é. Muito especial. And to Pedro, who joined you in this journey, literally, and has helped you throughout the good, but maybe most important, the bad moments. And what a journey it was. It all started as normal, with an interview. But after having interviewed several candidates that didn't inspire me, I must say that I was not very enthusiastic, nor confident, that I would find the right person throughout an online interview, if only we knew by then. But boy, I was so wrong. Your energy, your enthusiasm, your kindness immediately convinced me, and for no moment up to today, I regret that decision. I was, you were, we both were very enthusiastic about starting this project, but soon came the bug. COVID hit us within the first months of your appointment, just when we had so much to do and so much energy to start. It wasn't easy, but looking back, I think we did our best to eliminate as much inconvenience and discontent as possible among the group during those times. We did our best, the supervisors, but I know you did even better, getting to know the other lab members at private gatherings at each other's places, making new friends, always very accompanied by, I think we all know what I'm going to say, karaoke and alcohol, <laughs> and preferably tequila. <laughs> but those times also turned out to be very productive, as you managed to publish your first paper of your PhD during the COVID times, but not without some tears due to not being directly accepted, but having to go through major revision, which now we know it's normal. We are both Portuguese, and although we share many interests and many Tuga habits, we also differ a lot. Soon I realized that giving a deadline to Joana needed to be better thought of. Not only she would comply with the deadlines, she would do it one or two days earlier. Which Portuguese does, do, does that? <laughs> Having me as a supervisor must have been a nightmare. But Joana always kept being very kind, sending very gentle reminders, of which I still maybe need one or two for things that are still pending. 
But don't be fooled by the COVID time or by Joanna's angel face. What Joanna missed during the, that period was completely recovered exponentially in the remaining time. Always ready for a party, for a drink, for fun. This is also how Joanna became my tequila surveyor. She goes above and beyond to find us a shot of tequila. <laughs> the last year of her PhD was quite intense. Not only she needed to recover the lost time in terms of experimental work, she also went to several national and international congresses. She was very active with Buidem Karim and also in the Train Heart Consortium. She went to Hamburg to perform experimental work for three months. She followed several courses and even won several prizes. And don't forget that on top of that, she had to keep up with a very active social life <laughs> and tequila. <laughs> Joanna, tired or not, hangover or not, stressed or not, sad or not, you were always very responsible, loyal, respectable, hardworking. It was a pleasure having you in my group, working with you, and you are missed already. I can only hope we can remain friends. To finish, I would like to wish you all the best by citing one of my favorite songs of George Palma, a Portuguese songwriter and singer. So I'll do this part in Portuguese, I'm sorry. I'm not going to sing, though. <laughs> Na terra dos sonhos podes ser quem tu és, ninguém te leva a mal. Na terra dos sonhos toda a gente trata toda a gente por igual. Na terra dos sonhos não há pó nas estrelinhas, ninguém se pode enganar. Abre bem os olhos, escuta bem o coração, se é que queres, se é que queres ir para lá morar. Se queres ver o mundo inteiro à tua altura, tens de olhar para fora sem esquecer que dentro é que é o teu lugar. E se às duas por três vires que perdeste o balanço, não penses em descanso, está ao teu alcance e tens de o encontrar. Follow your dreams and be happy. Thank you. So I would also like to, to give Professor Ines Falcao the, the time to, give, to say a few words because you are online. Dear candidate, uh, dear Joana, it's, it was a great pleasure to argue this thing is online. You know, I'm terribly <coughs> sorry not being there today, but I wish you all the luck. And as I told in the beginning, I, I see you getting into bigger steps and getting into big achievements uh, that will extend beyond this day. And I'm anxious to watch you and see you doing that. So congratulations on your future and good luck with everything. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So dear doctor, not candidate anymore, Dr. Da Silva. So also on behalf of the Maastricht University, I would like to congratulate you with the degree you have acquired. So you have really given a very clear and structured presentation and also hold the degree committee really agreed you were on top of the content, relaxed, you didn't clearly need any tequila to, to stand here. So I would also like to congratulate uh, your promotion team, family and friends. I would also like to thank the committee members, especially those coming from abroad or further away in the Netherlands and, and Professor Ines uh, to be online. So I wish you also personally a very bright and I'm sure uh, bright scientific future, also personal future. So carpe diem, enjoy this day especially and of course your future. So before I end the session, I would like to say that we will first take some pictures on the chair here outside. Meanwhile, you can go out and go to the reception in the refter. Uh, to afterwards also congratulate uh, the doctor. So to, with this, I would like to end this ceremony. Yeah, I'm just going to